Welcome, everybody. As for our online viewers tonight, we thank you for choosing us. So if you like what you hear tonight, please let us know. There's a donate button right at the top of the My AMC website. And I have some exciting news tonight. Uh, we have fixed our YouTube page. Yes, praise the Lord. Yes, and so now if you search uh, using My AMC Media Group, all one word, we have more than 300 videos that will come up. And they'll come up now in a nice ordered list based on whatever type of device you have. If you have a tablet, a smartphone, or whatever, they're going to come up. So I encourage you all uh, to, to test it. So, so the, the message title tonight is um, entitled, What If? So many times uh, we go through our life asking this question. We ask, what if? Uh, so I'm going to be talking uh, tonight uh, from the book of Romans. Primarily, some other scripture verses, but uh, let's talk a little bit about the book of Romans. Uh, I believe it's vital uh, that you become as much of an expert uh, on this book. Uh, it's been called the Constitution of Christianity. All the correct foundational doctrines of how to live life as a, as a true Christian are there. It's the book to know in the New Testament. So I'm going to be talking at it at tonight. Here's some facts you probably didn't know. Did you know that at Harvard University, it's the oldest institution of higher learning in the United States. It was founded in 1636. That it was one of a series of schools, right? The Ivy League schools. They were designed to train pastors. Later, it added a law school. But its primary focus was to train pastors. Every law student was required as part of their first year law training to read and even memorize the book of Romans. Why? Because it was unanimously agreed upon that the book of Romans is one of the greatest examples in existence of what a legal brief should be, particularly in the style, content, and format. So imagine being a law student. You have a prosecutor and you have a defense attorney. Both of them have to read and memorize the book of Romans. And imagine being a student in a mock court case. I would have loved to have been there. So that practice uh, continued until 1926. So the first what if I have tonight is sort of a predecessor to the second. And here's the question tonight for all of us tonight. What if how we see and live for God has been wrong? And, and, and by wrong, I don't mean entirely wrong, but I mean there's just been enough bad doctrine, bad hearing, bad stuff we've learned, where we say to ourselves even, well, you know, that, that, that sounds good to me, and we wind up off the track. And unless you ask this question right away, hmm, what I just heard, I, I, I think I need to pray about it. If you don't do that, the Holy Spirit's going to have to go in overdrive. He will have to go in overdrive because once that new thought and that new reality sinks in, it's going to take a lot of work to undo that. Just enough of a lie to make our perception of God wrong. And from a spiritual standpoint, you can't afford to be wrong. The results can be devastating. There's a very good chance, at the very least, you will backslide. Now, I'm talking to believers tonight at least the people who believe and know that they're saved. And you might want to write this down for online viewers. How you perceive one of the fundamental doctrines, and that is free will, is going to ultimately shape your perception of God. 
You have to understand free will. That's what we've been talking about in the Bible studies these last couple of weeks. And so let me, let me ask you a couple of questions tonight, test you a little bit. Does God give me free will in all of my choices? Think about that. I'm going to follow that up with another question. Am I free to not sin? No. You're not free to not sin. We see that from the, from the word. What does it say in 1 John 1, 8? If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And if you look at that carefully, he's talking about the present. It's not in the past. So then we have free will, but it's conditional. It's conditional on our sin nature. Yes, it's probably a good place to start, but that removes any idea of us having complete autonomy over our life and our choices. So before we dive into any detail on the second and more important what if, you need to ask God to help you to understand this. It's critical. I'm highly of the belief that you are saved by grace through faith. It's a gift from God, lest anyone should boast. Ephesians 2.8. So those are good, good places to start. Here's another uh, subtle lie that we as pastors, we hear this a lot. Oh, you know, God uh, just hasn't given me that kind of faith. Everyone has their own measure of faith, and I can't measure up to this person. Is that true? Well, if you go to Romans 12, 3, that's what it says. Everyone has their measure of faith. But by no means is Paul telling you to use that as a crutch, right? We know that that's not true. Philippians 3, 14 says this. It's one of the most important verses in the Bible. We are to strive for the high calling of God. And one of the most important, important verses in the Bible Romans 10, 17, right? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's why we start our Shabbat services at 10, 17. I want to build on that verse a little bit. 2 Timothy 2, 15. Study to show yourself approved of God, a workman who need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If you choose not to make time and study the word, you will not be approved by God. I mean, that's, it, that's what it says. And one of the most profound and sobering verses in all of Scripture, one of my favorite, favorite verses, Hebrews 11, verse 6, and what does that say? Without faith... It's impossible to please God. It's impossible to please God. You can write this down. You will never please God solely, solely by your works. You must have faith. Faith comes by hearing. All covered nicely, we see, in what we could be called God's legal brief. And those verses I just mentioned, they form what we call a core value. A core value is a value that you hold most central to your behaviors and your actions. Acts 17, 28. In him, we live and move and have our being. That is the most complete and condensed statement that's, that sums up why do we get up every day? That's our number one core value, which leads me to the second what if, and that is this. What if the key to life itself and life more abundantly, more amazing, more than anything that your own imagination could possibly create, 
were to be summed up and contained in this one declaration. I am committed to living my life unto the lordship of Yeshua HaMashiach. I am committed to living my life unto the lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, that might sound like a call to salvation. What I'm really saying is this. I ask this question to all of you tonight, particularly our online viewers. What does it mean for Yeshua to be Lord, Lord of your life? I ask this of anyone who does not know him or who has not been saved. Maybe you have heard of him. What I'm attempting to do tonight is I want you to see a new paradigm, the potential for a new normal tonight. Now, I ask this for another group of people tonight, for the people who are saved and walking with the Lord. Tonight, don't just see him as Savior and, and not just as God, not just the one I pray to when I need something, but Lord, Lord of my life. And so my challenge tonight for you, and for that's really for these two groups, I'd like to challenge you tonight. Take the next week, take the next 160 hours, and I'm asking you to ask. That's all. I'm not asking you to do anything. If you're skeptical, great. God always honors an honest skeptic. But I ask that you ask sincerely this week. And I know, I just know someone is going to take me up on that. And if you hear an answer for your online viewers, we want to hear about it. I won't share your name. I just want to know what God has said to you when you ask that question. Knowing about God, hearing about God, is not going to save you. Having him as the one who saved you and believing, yes, that will save you. I want you to consider this tonight. Consider that you are putting God in a box when you decide to not make him Lord of your life. And you want to just go on with your life, living your life, and God is is there, but he's not Lord. That's why I'm asking these questions tonight. And do, and do me a favor, do not wait. When you leave here tonight, start that process of asking tonight. Because you see, here's the real reality of what we see as pastors, as teachers. Overwhelmingly, this is overwhelmingly what we see. Most people have various measures of faith. Most are struggling with something. And we're kind of like doctors, so to speak. Uh, we treat the result. But many times we fail to get to the root cause of things. Yes, and, and we, we know that God, he works even within that kind of a messed up system. The problem is it's just going to take longer for us to get a breakthrough. Many, many of us, we don't want to make the kinds of changes that we need to make in our life. We are in blatant disobedience, many of us. Now, there's others. There's another whole group of people who are on the other side of this. They don't think anything's wrong. They've been a Christian for 35, 40 years. Their time of struggling is over. They can recall those days, but the common answer we hear is, oh, I'm, I'm past that. I've, I've, I've grown in the Lord. Really. 
uh, we know what, what it says in the Bible about that. 2 Timothy 3.12 says this, yea, or better way, or better word rather, is indeed. That all who will live godly in Yeshua shall suffer persecution. Persecution is always in the present. It's not what happened before. Okay. The doctrine of the perseverance of the saints says you have to finish the race. In general, in general, at least the people we have here tonight, I don't think there's one person I see here who's not all in. For online viewers and some of the people who are going to be here tomorrow, God knows their heart, but we're here to minister to them and meet them where they are. Uh, and we know that some of them are just not all in. They're too concerned, dealing with their own stuff and in their own minds. Many of them say, I just don't have time. This, this world moves too fast, let alone wanting to suffer. After all, we've got this part of our brains, right? A little, little science here. What does it say? We've got a part of our brain that's wired to, to do two things, seek pleasure and avoid pain. So you're telling me that I have, I can have a victorious and a vibrant full life if I choose tonight to say yes to his lordship because I'm going to suffer? Yes, you will. And in my next message, I'm going to prove that, but not in the way that you think. What are we dealing with now? You're, you're, when somebody approaches you with that and tries to talk to you, your brain's going to go, as Rabbi Allen would say, warning, warning, little Robinson, warning, warning. I can't deal with that. Not only that, it's going to do whatever it can to direct you back to get in your current sick, depraved state of avoiding pain and seeking pleasure. It's going to do that at all costs. We, have had a, we had a very gifted man here a number of years ago uh, who, who has a ministry. He has a ministry out there in the neurosciences, and what he's trying to do is he's trying to get Christians to see the science. There is science behind some of these problems, but he brings science and the word into it. And he calls it, I, I love this term, he calls it a mind prison. We are, many of us are in a mind prison. And so what, what is the prison like? You, this is what your life is like today. God is there, but you, you get up, you get out of your cell, go down the hall, go to the cell. And there's another person there, and they've got problems. But, you know, that's, that's your inner circle. You get up, and you go about into the courtyard for the day. You're in the courtyard for the day, and that's your life. At the end of the day, everybody, go, everybody goes back to their cell. What's God saying? He wants you out of that prison. He wants you out of that prison. He wants you thinking differently. He wants you to, to think about what does it mean to be Lord. Problem is this, is that, what are many problems? People really don't believe 1 Corinthians 2.9. I, I think, I guess that's what it is. I hath not seen, nor ear hath heard, nor entered into the body of man the things that the Lord has prepared for those that love him. When you love him, he's Lord. We have the story of the rich young ruler, right? What a, what a great story we have. I really don't believe Yeshua wanted him to give up his money and his possessions. What he wanted from him was this. He wanted his willingness and his heart to give it up. I believe that had he had that heart, 
the Lord would have, would have said, that's fine, you can keep your money. I know where your heart is. That's what he wants from us. It's not that he doesn't want us to be wealthy. He wants us to see it the way he sees it. He can take it away just like that. And we've seen it. Many testimonies we have right here in this congregation. People have been blessed by the Lord because they have a right perspective on finances. Yes, they've struggled, but they've never questioned God and his priority in their life. Most people won't tell you that they don't want any suffering, but in fact, that is how they're, they're, they are prioritizing their time, and that is how they are showing up. That's how we see them. Point being, just enough of a lie to keep you out of hell and, and for you to get in with smoke on your clothes. So here's the rub. Here's the rub on that. The Bible says this. Those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Yes, that's true. Romans 10, 13. But have you considered this? Do you ever think of this scenario? Suppose you go out and you're in a car accident or you fall off of a cliff. You're out on a boat ride. You fall overboard. You hit your head. You lose consciousness. Paramedics come. Coast Guard, Rangers, whatever they are. Now you're in a hospital. You're injured severely. What happens? In most cases, they put you in a medically induced coma, right? So you're going to rely on calling on the name of the Lord while you're in a medically induced coma? What if you die and don't get a chance to call on the name of the Lord? What, what, hap what happens next? Well, it becomes purely a heart issue. And here's the gut-wrenching reality from God's word. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now you're silenced. And you're dead. What were your conversations about? And what were your priorities summed up to be by what you said? Acted on by what you did, by virtue of your deeds. What were your motivations? Getting my next pleasure or fix out of life or the lordship of Jesus Christ? We see that happening all the time. I'll leave you with this what if. This was another what if I had. What if Paul said no on the road to Damascus. You ever thought about that? What if he said no? This is what I believe. I think God would have raised up somebody else, um, but Christianity would have been dealt a, se a severe blow, and I don't think things would have turned out um, the way they, they are today. I thank, I thank the Lord that he did, did say yes. So for, your on, for primarily my online viewers tonight, I'm, I'm going to ask you to consider this challenge for the people that are here tonight I should ask them tonight what two questions what do I need to do tonight to make you Lord Lord of all what do I need to do to make you Lord tonight Lord of Lord of all so that's the really the crux of the message tonight um, I want you to think about that I want you to Think hard on that. Hallelujah. The great I am. Indescribable. All songs to get us thinking about his lordship. Before Rabbi Allen uh, closes us out in the ironic benediction tonight, I just want to say this. You know, the best part of getting up here and doing this is it really never gets tired at all. Um, 
10 years, 20 years from now, hope to be up here, and we all do, right? We all here really long for the day with a lot of these messages where uh, someone or a group of people will come up and say, you know, I finally got it. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, but I just had to see what it was like to take one more trip around the mountain. Well, now Pastor Greg or, or Rabbi Allen, I'm here to repent and his lordship. Uh, that's all that matters now. However, be careful. You don't want to be saying that as your nurse takes you back to your room for your next prescription and the lights are out at 9 o'clock. Why wait? It begins tonight. I think we've had the, those worship songs as a lead-in. So I challenge you. And is there any portion of my life tonight that you are not Lord of? Where, where is my time going? Am I spending enough quality time seeking more insight on your character? Finally, is everything okay, Lord? You need to be asking that probably more than anything because I know you'll get an answer on that. So if, if you're stuck in moving forward with the Lord's plan, it's, I believe it's highly likely that your priorities are not right, plain and simple. It could be that he's really not Lord of your life and you have not been asking. So I want to close with this parable tonight. Luke 18, verses 1 through 8. Here it is. Then Yeshua told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with a plea, who kept coming to him with a plea. Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time, he refused. But finally, he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, and here it is, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will ask, I will or rather, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said this, listen to what the unjust judge says, and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see them get justice and quickly. However, and here's the warning, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Tired of being put off? Maybe you should start crying out to God for insight, for kingdom, kingdom level faith. The faith that says this, I'm all in, no matter what. Amen.